Uh, I see him. There he is. Look at that. I get the smile. I see my man, David Hale. He is a tremendous writer and works for ESPN.com. And you can read all of his college football stuff there. And well, let's get to the piece, uh, how college football's transfer portal is changing spring practice. For, I, I, a lot of my listeners certainly and viewers have have read it. And and I, it's, it's the topic du jour. It's what everybody wants to know. We all love college football. And David, I want to I start with sort of an observation. Uh, and, and I'm kind of curious. It's been a while since you and I talked. But you end the piece by saying a new round of roster uh, movement is is coming. And I feel like for fans, that feels like that's true in perpetuity, that they don't know what is anymore. Like the, the, all of the parameters, all of the rules of yesteryear are gone. All of the methodologies have changed. What's possible has changed. But also, you know, trying to – and the coaches talk about it in this piece – re-recruiting your own roster, worrying about a guy putting his name in in the middle of a season and so that they can get there in time for the – it's just – it's crazy town in college football right now. And I just – I want to know, do you hear from the college football fan what I seem to sense, which is where's my sport? What is happening to the sport I once loved? Fair or not, that just feels like what I'm getting back is this vibe of we already have pro sports. I, I don't want this. Yeah, I think there's definitively something to that. And I, I've, it's funny because I think we spent way too long thinking, what do what is good for the programs, the coaches, the academic leaders, the ADs, whatever. Um, they were sort of the voice that mattered. And we've seen, I think largely for good, a seismic shift towards empowering the players. Uh, and that has come, I think, from, from the media, from the players having more of a voice, and certainly from the from the courts, which have delivered the NCAA a ton of L's over the last couple of years. Um, What is missing consistently from those conversations is the third piece to the puzzle, which is the fans, are the ones that are paying the bills via ticket purchases, TV ratings, all of that. And I think that that you're absolutely right. Look, with any change, there is going to be some discomfort and angst. Uh, And so I think there is inherently a little bit of that being overrated in that uh, once people get used to things, that change tends to be less of a big deal. But I think there are uh, genuine concerns. And, I mean, you point to one. What is it that makes college football, if not better, certainly different than the NFL? Well, one thing is the fact that you don't have uh, free agency season happening every year. Um, I think there is – you know, I've covered, I've covered professional sports too, and I think there's a, a genuine difference in the investment – that fans make in their players um, for a lot of reasons. But I think number one, because it's guys who were going to the school that they went to sitting in the same classrooms that they sat into going to the same, you know, bars out on Tennessee street that they went to. Um, There's something to be said for that sort of connection that you lose that when everything sort of becomes as the old uh, Jerry Seinfeld joke, that we're all rooting for laundry because you're just, the uniforms are the only things that stay the same. And, and I guess even if you're Oregon, that's not even true. So um, I, I think that, that, that you lose something. There's definitely something that is being lost here. And I think um, the two questions that you need to ask are, one, are we gaining something that is more important than what is being lost? And B, uh, is there any alternative to it anywhere? Are we beating our, our heads against a wall for something that is now, you know, the toothpaste is out of the tube, the bell has been rung, et cetera, et cetera. And I think even if you embrace the radical shift that we've seen now, and you and I have had conversations about this over the years, we we were in favor of players being able to benefit from name image likeness and make some money and and all those things. I think there are a lot of college football fans who thought it was uh, long past due for something like that to happen. I think the fear stems from there doesn't seem to be a regulatory group (laughs) coming to save the day anytime soon because the NCAA is impotent and has put their hands up and lost in court uh, as, as we knew they would. And as seemingly has always been the case, the NCAA did never get out in front of what was coming. And because they didn't, it feels like to a lot of us and a lot of college football fans, this is a free for all. Anybody oh, can do whatever the hell they want to do. And how do you, how do you change that? Because the coaches in your piece quoted, um, David, they they don't seem to have – I mean, they've got suggestions, but they don't believe there's anybody coming to specifically lay down guidelines and rules to be adhered to by these schools anytime soon. 
No, there's not, frankly, there's not. And um, this is the NCAA's own doing, first of all. Let's, let's just be very clear. And, and this is one of the things that is really frustrating me about the conversations that we're having around a lot of the changes, the transfer portal, NIL, and, and there are definitively bad consequences to this. Uh, and I don't know who would argue that. Um, but those bad consequences were inevitable. And the NCAA, I, I think you can, an optimist or somebody who wants to believe the NCAA is genuinely uh, attempts to be a benevolent organization, just were, were their hands were tied. Um, I would argue they made that choice on their own too. Uh, or I think if you want to believe the NCAA is not so benevolent, that, that they're glad to see this happen because now they can say, look, we told you so. We gave the players a little bit of power and look what it's done to our sport. Um, but there's a little bit of that conversation going on. But the fact of the matter is, ain't nobody doing anything about it. And you talk to folks in college football and the, and the leadership in college football, and they've said the NCAA is, is effectively a non-entity when it comes to regulation. Now, they are so afraid of being uh, sued for an antitrust violation uh, that would effectively end amateurism altogether. I would argue we're pretty much knocking at that door right now anyway, so what does it matter? Um, and B, um, the federal government could certainly step in in some uh, capacity, but I don't think there's a, a lot of uh, enthusiasm for doing that when there are much bigger uh, fish to fry at that level. And certainly you don't see a lot of uh, congressmen getting on the same page about anything right now, let alone something as ancillary as this. And, uh, you know, even if they were to do this, I don't think that, that anything that comes down from them is necessarily going to be the things that, that college football fans or leadership likes. I mean, read Justice Kavanaugh's opinion in the Alston case. That's probably what mainstream um, Washington, D.C. federal government is going to be looking at from a legal standpoint. And that the answer there is like, <laughs> amateurism doesn't work. We can't have it like this anymore. So that's the answer right now. So uh, I, I want to read an excerpt and then ask you a question. Uh, this is from, from the story, David. Uh, the addition came on the heels of stern comments from Saban about the current transfer marketplace, which, when aided by lax restrictions on name, image, and likeness, has created a de facto free agency that Saban deemed, quote, unsustainable. Do all or almost all of the coaches you talk to share that viewpoint? Yeah, everyone. Uh, I don't think anyone wants to be, or at least will vocally say, I want to be in this current scenario. Now, there are certainly coaches and programs that are doing a better job of navigating these waters, and Saban is on that list. I mean, Saban can sit there and decry this situation all he wants, and he's not necessarily wrong, but you can also make the case that no program has benefited more from it than Alabama and Nick Saban. I mean, he's got a laundry list of guys just this year that I think are going to make his team a whole hell of a lot better that he has, largely because of NIL and the transfer portal. Um, and we're certainly seeing that at the, the, the high school recruiting level with what Texas A&M is doing. We're seeing that in the transfer market constantly. Lane Kiffin, I think, has done a wonderful job with it. Um, I don't know that if you peg down Jimbo or Lane or Saban and said, like, do you like this? Is this the way you want to do business? I'm not sure they'd say yes. Um, they'd probably be maybe a little less vocal than, than Saban was. But at the end of the day, like, this is – the rules are what they are, which is effectively that there are none. Um, and there are programs that are poised to take advantage of that situation. There are programs – um, I think you could probably put Clemson a little bit in this conversation of saying, like, I don't like this and I'm not going to do it that way unless I absolutely have to. Uh, and then there's programs that I think would love to that just don't have the resources to do it. So, um, you know, there was an interesting article, and I'm going to forget who wrote it, so I apologize, but I think it, it was in uh, – yeah, just kill me because I can't remember any of this. But basically it said, um, you know, show me a team who is – doing uh, poorly in this modern era, and it was probably a team that was doing poorly before all of this too. Largely, you have the teams that were successful are staying successful in this marketplace, and the teams that weren't aren't. So a little bit of it is sort of splitting hairs, but I don't think anybody likes the way that business is being done. And I'm not even sure when you start talking to the players how much they like the feeling of like constantly having to be worried about, is there a better opportunity out there for me? Um, and I don't know that like a guy like DJ Uyunglele would like, sit there and say this specifically, because uh, I don't think he wants to make any excuses, but 
you, you look at sort of the burden that was on his shoulders last year with the national television deal and being one of the first true faces of NIL, and he hadn't really proven himself yet. And then he went out on the field and looked really bad. And I think it's hard to separate all of those things. So we have put a lot on the players. On the other hand, like, what's like, what again is the alternative? Were we better in a situation? Fans might have been better, coaches might have been better, but I still don't think the players were in a better place before all of this. And so it's hard to ignore that. Yeah, I almost want to cut to the chase and ask you to project, knowing what you do and as much as you've written, followed, and educated yourself over the years on this process, what happens two, three, four years down the road? Do we get some of what you talked about in the article, or at least what coaches alluded to, which is this idea? You know, we just finished, we just got done covering spring football, for example, of course, and the entirety of that spring football camp, beyond looking at players that are improving and which players came in and how to lend context to my audience about what Florida State looks like here, here, and here, the re- basically we were writing something and, and talking about something on a daily basis that you wrote about, which is that, okay, this kid's not winning the job. Are they going to have to re-recruit him or is he as good as gone? That's all of spring now for all of these coaches. It's this idea that, and I'll quote from your article here, the result is that the winter is as much about recruiting your own roster as it is recruiting high school talent coaches say, and the spring is constant guessing game as to who will endure a spot down the depth chart and who will just walk away if they don't win the job. I added that last part. That's what we were sitting there doing now. That's what everybody does when they cover college football now is if you're at a spring practice, you're like, oh. That guy's going to win the starting corners job. Well, dude behind him or behind him is a redshirt junior. Peace. He's gone. There's no chance he sticks around here. Is 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 something going to change in terms of the timing of or how to handle that in which they change the dates by which players can freely move? Uh, there's a lot to sort of pick, take away from this. I think the, the first thing is that um, – you're right. I mean, this is sort of a, a, an obvious concern. And worse than that is, is um, I had a good talk with Manny Diaz about this and, and, and talked about some of his ideas uh, that he put forth uh, in the article. But um, one thing he pointed out is like, let's not try to save spring football by, and let it further ruin the regular season. I'm much more concerned about the guys that are leaving during the season than the guys who are leaving after spring practice because they don't like their spot on the depth chart. And frankly, some of that is a good thing. You can look at a guy that was at Florida State last year who's about to make a whole hell of a lot of money because he didn't like his spot on the depth chart at Georgia and picked up and moved to Florida State and had a really, really good football season. And he's going to be a first-round draft pick now. There's, I mean, it's hard to tell these guys you shouldn't be doing this when there are guys who are clearly benefiting from it. Not all of them, but, but some clearly are. Um, I think there is certainly um, the notion out there of what, can we just establish transfer windows? Can we at least limit when this is happening? Again, you're asking the NCA to do something it has been unwilling to do until this point. And I've talked to several coaches who think that this is, it's not going to happen anytime soon either uh, on this point. Uh, what Manny Diaz has suggested is at least incentivize the right thing so that if you can't create guidelines or regulations to keep guys from doing it, at least don't incentivize it. And so his point was like the the desire or um, push to be on campus for spring ball and winter workouts means you've got to have guys enrolled in January. And that's why so many guys are leaving in November to get in the transfer portal and take their visits because they need to have that stuff wrapped up by, you know, essentially the early signing day in early December. So everything about the way the calendar is currently constructed right now um, is incentivizing what we already don't want to have happen. So I think that's that's a small step that could be taken that actually could happen from the NCAA's standpoint without putting any restrictions on players, but simply change some of the incentive structure so that there's not as much of a desire to do it at the worst possible times. But the fact of the matter is, is, is the only real long-term solution here to get actual regulations, to get some sort of guardrails within the situa- within the, the, the entire construct of all of this, is to bring the players to a negotiating table and say, what are you, what will you accept also? Because everything else besides that is an antitrust violation. And so if you're gonna do that, then we are looking at a world in which we have effectively professionalized the sport. And again, you can argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it is the only way out of this, though. I'm curious. um, Have you heard whether or not uh, conferences will have any inclination to reel in some of this since the NCAA can't? 
or, or will not. Have you heard yeah. anything like that? Well, some of the recent moves just in the last 48 hours or so regarding the NTA and their governance over effectively what they're going to say we're not in the business of doing anymore and it'll be conference decisions about, um, you know, coaching limitations and stuff like that. Like, this is the first step towards doing that. Um, I think what we will ultimately see is that there are conferences who are going to say, we don't care if we're paying players directly. We'll go ahead and professionalize this ourselves. I mean, this has been the, the idea, I think, for at least the past few months, maybe the past year now, is that we're going to get to some sort of super conference structure. Um, I think, you know, we've sort of all forgotten, and I think rightly so, about the quote-unquote alliance between the Big Ten, ACC, and, and Pac-12. I think a little bit of that is is the Pac-12 and the ACC just making sure they've got um, you know, a seat to sit in when, when the music stops by partnering up with the Big Ten. Um, I, I think that ultimately that's where a lot of this leads is that we have sort of a two-tiered structure of, of college football where you have one or two super conferences that, that are willing to bring players to the table, that are willing to treat them as uh, employees, and that will negotiate some sort of guardrails within the construct of, of how they're going to do business that will make this work. And it will probably look very similar to the NFL. And then I think you'll have other schools that say, we don't have the resources to do that, or we don't want to do that, um, and we'll attempt to maintain some level of amateurism um, and in the process probably lose out on a good chunk of the TV revenue that they're getting right now. Again, I, it's, it's going to force a lot of very difficult decisions, and it's going to force a lot of the powers that be who have been saying the things that they want to say to benefit their situation to actually sit down and make some hard choices. David, how does the super conference reality come to be? Like in the chicken or the egg game, is it the TV networks? or conferences that, that start the change? I think it's the conferences, probably, more, more than anything. I think, frankly, it's the SEC. Um, what you have, certainly with adding Oklahoma and Texas, was a, I think what a lot of people thought was a first step in that direction. I mean, frankly, if you look at the financial structure and what the projections are over the next 10 years, we're living in two absolute different realities with what the Big Ten and the SEC are able to uh, create in revenue, what everybody else is able to do. Um, at some point, you know, right now, the ACC is being saved by a grant of rights deal that runs through the mid-2030s. But every year that passes, the value of that grant of rights deal uh, goes down, and the amount of money that you could make, the share of money that you could make in the SEC versus what you're making in the ACC goes up. So just do the math on that. This is not sustainable over the long term. So eventually, and I've, I've, I've heard rumblings that, you know, maybe there becomes some uh, class action lawsuits against these grant of rights agreements in the first place and, and schools trying to get out of them early. It's always, you know, everything's possible it's just what the price tag is. And frankly, eventually the price tag is going to become affordable enough, relatively speaking, that, that I think the, the levy breaks and it starts to happen. And, um, I don't know when that happens. My guess is if it's 10 years from now, that's probably the long end of this timeline. My guess is it might be something sooner than that. I'm curious. You've got great insight and have done a great job of covering the ACC for a very long time, and that includes Clemson, obviously. How pissed off are your Clemson contacts, for example, as far as the creative rights deal goes? I mean, look, this is this – is, um, <laughs> I think there's everybody that's a little pissed off about it. But here's the thing. I've sat down with um, a lot of leadership in the ACC, including at Clemson, who said, like, look, we've done our homework on this. And frankly, what we're being paid by ESPN and others right now is not that far off from what the ACC's true value is relative to its peers. The problem is partially that that deal can't be changed any time in the near future and, and – Networks like ESPN have zero incentive to change it, uh, barring some sort of large-scale change within the membership of the ACC. But the flip side of that problem, too, is that, that Clemson has essentially been the only program carrying the, the flag. And until Florida State and Miami are, are playing like earners again, or until Notre Dame joins the league, or until some other shift changes that shifts the value of the ACC, you could end the grant of rights tomorrow, and it wouldn't 
change what the ACC's value is very much. I think what it would do is allow schools like FSU, Miami, Clemson, uh, North Carolina to start looking to see if the grass is greener or in other pastures. And, and I think that's certainly something that is on the mind of fans. I think right now, again, the, the relative price tag is too high, but genuinely every day that passes, that price tag gets a little lower. The grass is most assuredly greener, Dave. <laughs> I don't, the grass ain't even green on the ACC side. Actually. We're talking about yellow versus green. It's yellow and limp, and it's patchy. It's just not good, David. I see it all the yes, time. That's what my lawn looks like, too, though, so I'm not, <laughs> not going to knock too much. It's, it's hard work keeping those lawns up. This is part one. We'll do part two down the line. My brother, I always appreciate the conversation. It's great to see your face. The beard looks good. and uh, <laughs> I, I look forward to seeing you at the ACC kickoff soon enough, brother. Be good, man. All right, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.